Hello, welcome to the next installment of Crafting with Calandra. Tonight we're going to go over bead embroidery. Now, most often what you probably see as examples of bead embroidery in the current time period is going to be from Indigenous people, for Native Americans, First Nations, uh, that type of work. However, the use of beads and embroidery on various things goes back to many different cultures and time periods. You can find examples all throughout Europe, especially in the 12th and 13th centuries, and you will find use of glass beads, metal beads, as well as pearls. And some things that you may see bead embroidery used on are the cuffs on tunics. You can also see it on the centerpieces of dresses, on pouches, uh, ecclesiastical headpieces. There's some very vivid examples of that from the 12th century with all kinds of complex designs on there. And you can also find examples in other parts of the world with two. You will see think people using shells, bits of wood, bits of glass. Uh, but the glass beads themselves though generally came from Europe. So with the Native American bead embroidery, prior to Columbus, they were generally using porcupine quills, bits of wood and bone and nuts and things like that. Uh, the trade with glass beads was actually a very uh, big thing with that. Uh, so just a little bit of the history with that, but the techniques used are very similar and there are a lot of different stitches. One of them I'm going to show the bead of back stitch. I don't know the actual history of that one, but I know that's one of the most commonly used ones today. The other stitch that we're going to go over is uh, couching, which that one I know definitely for Europe wise goes into being in the medieval period. So when we're getting started with the bead embroidery, first I'm going to show some examples of bead embroidery. So let me bring those up for you. Okay, so this is a work in progress that I was working on that I need to figure out where it is at some point. Uh, but this I use a combination of bead embroidery and couching and various beads and it's being stitched down onto a piece of felt. It's going to end up then getting attached to a piece of leather to make a necklace. And then this one I actually did as a challenge with an online event that was supposed to be done uh, that day. You found out what the project was at the beginning of the day and how to finish it by the end of the day. So this is just a little, uh, a little flower that's stitched on a piece of felt that will eventually become a brooch or a necklace centerpiece. So you can make things into jewelry or barrettes, things like that, or use it directly on garb. And one more. There's a better picture of this on the event, the close up, but this is the full item of what it, what it is. And this was stitched down onto a backing of interfa interfacing and then sewn onto the velvet. And then that last outer line of white beads on here was actually done directly onto the velvet to hide the interfacing uh, with everything. And then this is lined with satin and then has a satin cord on it. And so it's just a little tiny pouch thing. I like to make small pouches that tend to hold mundane things like inhalers <laughs> or phones, good things to hide things with. So I've mentioned uh, a few things on what you might use as backing. So felt is a common one for something that you don't plan to wash. So if you're making a piece of jewelry, felt is an easy thing to stitch things down onto. And then eventually you'll back it with something like velvet or a piece of leather. A uh, deerskin was, is something that's commonly used and you can stitch directly to deerskin, but I don't like doing it because it's a lot harder to work with because you're just going through the outer layer of it and not going all the way through. And that you can get curved beading needles, which is what you really need for that, but they're a lot harder to find on that. So, but interfacing, recommend using something that's not fusible. 
uh, you can use the heavyweight stuff or lighter weight. I have used lighter weight fusible. I just didn't use the fusible properties of it, like the really lightweight stuff, not anything that's going to be gummy. Because some of the heavier fusible stuff, you're going to gum up your needles too much if you try to stitch through it. There's also something called lacy stiff stuff, which is a stiff and non-woven fabric that is commonly used for people that are doing heavy jewelry pieces, especially anything that involves putting a cabochon on it, which is usually like a round stone that you would put beads around it and such. Because of the weight of those pieces, they want something that's a little bit heavier before backing it with the leather or the velvet to make the jewelry. You can stitch directly to fabric, but it's not recommended if you're doing something that's going to be completely covered in beads, such as if you were going to be doing a full figure of an animal, then stitching directly to fabric is not the best thing to do because it'll start weighting down and you start to pucker, especially if you wash it and things shrink and can change things. If you're just doing outlines, like a lot of the stuff that I've seen from period with the cuffs, they're doing kind of like a scroll type gentle scrolling thing and outlining with the pearls and then embroidery on the sides of it. And that will usually hold up. I have a skirt that I just did some simple outlines of flowers on it and it's actually gone through the washer and dryer and is still still together after over 10 years. It just depends sometimes on how you want to treat things. I would recommend not putting it in the dryer, but I do things differently at times. But what you can do if you do want to stitch directly to a regular fabric is you can also attach a lightweight interfacing to it using an embroidery hoop or if you want to risk and you know, try doing a sample of a lightweight fusible and see how your needles hold up going through it. But you can also use tearaway. Uh, the, it, it essentially, you would attach it through the, with the embroidery hoop and your fabric. And then when you're done, you can tear the stabilizer away. And so it's at least there while you're trying to stitch things down and it'll be under part of your project. Now we're gonna, I'm gonna switch cameras and cause I'm gonna show you some different things as far as needles and beads of what to use. So there are a lot of options and a lot of things that you can try. Okay, so the beads that I have here, these larger ones are called e-beads. And those are pretty easy to find at any craft store. They're generally not very even. When you look at a package, you'll find some that are maybe a little larger than others in like thickness and some that are thinner and they're not very even. If you're going for a more period look, the more uneven beads like that are actually more historically correct. Modern beads that you can find, like such as these smaller ones, are almost always going to be perfectly identical. And depending on what type of project you're doing, that may be the look that you want to go for as well. I recommend Fire Mountain Gems is a good resource for a lot of different size beads, a lot of different types. If you look at ones that are called Delicas, those are going to be more cylindrical. They're very evenly cut. Uh, the ones Hi. that I have here that are smaller are a Japanese brand that starts with an M. I don't remember the name of it, how to pronounce it. But these are size 11, I believe. They might be 10s, but I think they're 11s. I do not recommend going smaller than an 11 aught. With beads and the beading needles, the smaller the number, or I'm sorry, the larger the number, the smaller the bead and the smaller the needle. 15 knots are ones that you can easily find, but they are very hard to find thread that will go through the needle and also incredibly hard to thread the needles. So 10 or 11s are a good bead to use if you're wanting to use something, do something small. And 
you can also, I like size eight as kind of an in-between of things too. As far as the threads, when you're looking at the jewelry section of a craft store, you'll find a lot of different beading threads, but you need to be very careful because a lot of the ones that are just labeled generically as beading threads are not going to go through a size 11 or even a 10 bead, and especially not for more than one pass. And it's important to have a thread and a needle that can go through your bead more than once because a lot of the stitches involve multiple passes through the beads and you don't want your needle to get stuck. One type of thread that I like is called Nemo. It's N-Y-M-O. And the size D will work with the 10 knots and some 11s, but not consistently with all 11s. And sometimes it can be hard to get it through the needle. I like the, if you're using the size 11 beads, I like the double aught size of the Nemo thread. It is very thin and will, and is a lot easier to get through the beads for multiple passes. As far as needles, there are many different types of needles that you can use. I have these that are color coded that will also help tell you which size that you're using. So I know that when I'm looking at my pink ones, I have size 12. And then when my purple eyed ones are size 10, I have a size 10 out here right now. And it's actually going through the 11, the 11s. But if I was needing to do a lot of passes, I would switch to the size 12 needle on that because it's just a little thinner. Needle threaders will be your friend with trying to thread through everything. However, with some of the smaller needles, it can be really hard to use the needle threader. Uh, that's part of why I like the double aught Nemo because it is, a, it is significantly thinner than everything else and easier to get through. I would recommend using a magnifying glass if you have a hard time seeing. You can, uh, to be able to thread a needle. You can also get what are called big eye needles. And let me pull up my sample of one of those. Okay. Just a minute. Okay, it looks like I don't have that out here. Uh, big eye needles are essentially where the entire needle is the eye that you can open it up and put the thread through. Now, they do work well with uh, size, size eight and e beads. Some tens you can get them to work, but they don't generally work well with 11 aughts because they're the part of the needle that goes through the fabric tends to be a little bit wider and has trouble going through the really small beads. But they're quite helpful for with trying to thread through things because you're not trying to get something through a really small hole. You can also get ones that are spiral that have a collapsible eye that when it goes through the beads, it will collapse. Those also usually work better with the size eight and larger. When you're going through this, they don't work very well with the small ones. They also tend to be very flimsy and don't like going through fabric very well. They're more used more with other types of jewelry, but they can still work. And if you're using the e-beads, you can use a regular needle, sewing needle and thread most of the time, uh, just a kind of a thinner needle. So that's some things for starting out with your supplies. I do also recommend getting some wax. The jewelry area, but also the sewing notions and quilting departments will usually have thread wax. You can buy a little container that actually has slots where you can thread your needle through and coat the thread with the wax. I don't know where mine is at the moment, but it's very helpful with keeping the thread from tangling and knotting up. Uh, so that's something. There's also some other thread conditioners you can buy. If you're using some of the larger beads, you can also get away with using dental floss. 
uh, but it does tend to fray at the end. And that's something that's already waxed for you that you can, that you can use and will hold up. If you're using regular thread, I recommend using polyester or, or nylon or some sort of blend. Regular cotton thread will tend to break. You can also use silk thread if you have that. That would certainly have been an option that would have been more period if you're trying to go that route. Uh, but we have a lot of nice modern products that make things a lot easier for us now. On that. So that's our getting started with your basics. And of course you wanna have some sharp scissors around uh, to help out. And so I'm gonna demonstrate with some larger beads cause it's a little bit easier to see. And I'm going to show the beaded backstitch, which if you're familiar with backstitch from embroidering and sewing, it means that you're sewing something forward and then you go back through but with these, what we're gonna do is we're not gonna go back through all of our beads, just a couple of them. And I'll show that here in a moment. Recommend only putting three or four beetles on, or beads on at the same time on your needle. Now those I just put on my own, but you can also just dip things, dip your needle into your container. You can put a little bit out on a plate, make it easier to get through and just, scoop up the, the beads. So I have three on here. I'm gonna push it all the way down next to where I started. Now, if you're starting with a fresh thread, you would not, I do highly suggest knotting the back of things and then trap, you can thread your starting, your end of your thread back through at the end. But I'm just laid this down next to where I've been. And then I'm going to stitch down right in front of that bead. You want to be that first bead or last bead, but the bead that's in the front. You want to be very careful to make sure that they're flat and that it doesn't pucker up. You don't, you want to pull it tight, but you don't want to pull it so tight that you cause the fabric to pucker or that you cause the beads to end up being raised up in the air. So then the next step, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come up, it's hard to see my needle, but it's right here. I'm coming up right next to the beads. And you're either gonna go through two beads or one bead. And what I'm doing is I'm putting my needle right here, I'm gonna go through two. And just pull it. And that locks the beads in place. Now, whether you go through two or one is gonna depend on the beads and the fabric you're doing and what type of shape. If you're doing a curve, then you may be only going through one bead at a time. And I'll demonstrate with curving. Now, sometimes with a curve, you may only wanna do two beads instead of three, which I'm gonna actually do here. Sometimes you may want a little more. So I'm going to manipulate my thread so it starts to form just a little bit of a curve. And I go down in front of that last bead that was put on. I'm going to come back up and I'm only going to go through one bead this time for the back stitch. Now with these being the uneven type of beads they are, it doesn't give the most gracious of curves, but you can see how it's curving a little bit there. That's the basics of the beaded back stitch. Now, the other commonly used technique that we'll see is the couching method. That generally 
involves two needles. You can do a kind of a faux couching with one, which I will demonstrate in a little bit, but first we're gonna do the, the regular. So I'm gonna get out a second needle. I'm gonna go ahead and pull that through. Now on this one, you can go ahead and put on as many beads as you want onto the, th the thread that you're gonna use the put the beads on. As you practice, you'll get an idea of how many you like to work with at once and such. How the couching works is with the second thread, what you would do is you're gonna go stitch over in periodic intervals over the other thread. So this is where I had started. So I'm gonna put my first couching stitch down there. And it just goes over that thread. Sometimes with the beaded back stitch, I'll just go back through. And if I'm seeing an area that's not very stable, I'll go through and couch over the thread to try to stabilize it more. And so I'm gonna go up again next to my between my last bead that's on here and the sec to last one. And I'm going to just stitch over that thread again. And this locks it into place. See, this is the last, this one's not attached there. And you can see there's a stitch. I'm making the stitches wider than I normally would. So hopefully they might be visible. But those are your two common stitches. So that after we do are done with the recording, we can go back and go over that again and try everything step-by-step step if you'd like. Uh, some common ways of putting your pattern down would be you can do, use the prick and pounce method that's commonly used with embroiderers where you have uh, some sort of pounce thing like uh, chalk and your pattern and you prick little holes over it and use the chalk and it'll transfer. Um, you can also use dressmakers transfer paper. On that, I would recommend making sure that your lines are very well covered with the beads though. You can use stencils and use other fabric markers and pencils to transfer things through. Uh, some common things to try with that. Okay, so that is the basics to help get you started. There are a lot of tutorials available. And if you have any questions, you can also reach out to me. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording and open up for questions. Just a moment while I get that stopped.